then there's no need to reset the camera. Well, it's okay. nice to have them separated. Questions, questions and answers, folks. I got one this time. Okay, fire away. Because when you were describing all this stuff, it kind of goes, maybe is there a connection between um, the eye that you talked about, coming or Mars when it came down to Earth, maybe the one of the one of my favorite things to study is um, you know people that left this Earth, all things have to be restored to the Earth. It almost looked like, hey, I'm taking you away. Hey, I'm going to bring you back. Yeah. Is that how you think the ten tribes might be restored? Well. I'm not one that believes the ten tribes were taken off the earth. I believe that is a myth. This is one of the reasons that it's so important to understand the real story behind the story. We are the ten tribes. I wrote a book called Parallel Histories and in that I lined out very briefly. I also have a monograph on my website, things as they are, or not my website, my blog, things as they are, as they were, and as they are to come, where I describe the idea of the lost tribes. But I'll just, I'll, 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 I'll give you a reason to not believe that they're off the earth, okay? Even though there's some LDS tradition out there that says that, I have no idea where that came from, okay? Can't substantiate where it came from. But I can tell you the research about the 10 tribes. In, in, um, um, the Egyptian pharaoh, Akhenaten. That's not the correct spelling. Anyway, A-H-K, Akhenaten, I'm not sure of the spelling. The Egyptian pharaoh, Akhenaten, tried to change the Egyptian religion. And, as, and while he's doing this, he lets the affairs of state go to pot. Well, it just so happens that while Akhenaten was in the throne in Egypt down here, um, Joshua and the leaders that came after him were trying to take back the Holy Land after the Exodus. But Akhenaten left us a library of communiques with his rulers in Palestine which is where Joshua was trying to conquer. They called the land Israel. The Romans called it Palestine as an insult to the Jews uh, after the Philistines. You know, they called the land Philista, Philistia, and we call it Palestine. Anyway, Akhenaten was, was all, of the, all of the rulers here, uh, are rulers in Palestine, we're writing letters to Akhenaten, save us, save us, these bandits from the West Desert are coming in and they're killing our people and taking over our cities. And these people, he, they write, are the Habiru, these bandits. Any guesses who the Habiru might have been? Hebrew. The Hebrews. And so we have this we have this library of writings uh, that, that is named after the town where they were discovered. Tel El Amarna in the uh, south end of the Sinai on the borders of Egypt. We have this whole library and Akhenaten is answering these rulers and one of them says, one of them says, well, the stories are amazing because it's all about um, now I'm trying to remember my history. Who was the first crowned king after they conquered the Holy Land? Before, bef before uh, David. David. Who was the king? Oh, oh, Saul. Yeah. Saul is known as Labayu in Akhenaten's and, and Saul thumbs his nose at the Pharaoh, says, you don't like it, come and get us. Now I'm, I'm getting off point. They called themselves the Habiru. Another little story that contributes to this is, is in the geography of the Holy Land, we have the uh, Sea of Galilee. 
and the uh, Jordan River that goes down to the Dead Sea. And, and this roughly defines the division after the time of um, <laughs> my brain is just not working for me tonight. The, the one, the one that Solomon. After Solomon, the kingdom was divided. There was the southern and the northern kingdom, and Galilee ended up in the northern kingdom. In fact, that was a common name for the northern kingdom. It was called it was called Israel because ten of the tribes resided there. Only two resided in the southern kingdom and uh, Benjamin, some of Benjamin, and all of Judah. In fact, in the time, this, this custom remained in place even down to the time of Christ. This, of course, happened just after the time of Solomon. But even down to the time of Christ, Jesus was called a Galilean. And in the New Testament, we have letters written to the Galatians. These were, these were communities of Galileans who had moved into Gentile territory uh, that we know in today as Turkey. Okay? And they were the Galatians that the apostles of Jesus Christ wrote letters to. Okay? Congregations. The Greeks knew these people from Galilee because they migrated out of this area and up into, across the uh, uh, Bosporus at Constantinople and up between the Black and the Caspian Sea and they moved, migrated into Europe. Sorry. <laughs> My video director's giving me you directions. You like showing off your chest. <laughs> I forget the camera's you there. You bang it while you're there. That's right. They moved, they moved up into Europe. And, and so the Greeks knew them. They called them the Galatai. And the Romans knew them. They called them the Gelts. All derivations of the word Galilee. Did Gelt later become Celt? Celt. Yeah. They moved into Europe, and we know them today as the Celts or the Celts. In fact, they left this name there too. The peninsula between Spain and France is still called the Celt Iberian Peninsula. The Celt from Galilee and the Habiru Ibernia. You go far enough north um, up the steppes and into uh, into northern what we would call Russia today, and you find that the area is called Siberia. There's Iberiu with an S on the beginning of it, because that's what the language required. Or you go to the ancient name of Ireland. Joseph Smith sent the first missionaries to England and then in Ireland, saying that that country was rich in the blood of Israel. If the Lord gave you a mandate to gather the house of Israel, you had to know where to look. Would it be the South Pole or another planet? No. He sent them to England and then to Europe. Why? Because that's where these people migrated. From the northern Israel, the ten tribes went and at least... Four major migrations. Um, uh, oh, I hope I can remember his name. A Latter-day Saint wrote a uh, thesis on the vowel shift in the Proto-Germanic language caused specifically by Hebrew-speaking people. What was his name, sweetheart? Uh, Barry. No, it wasn't. That was Barry Fell. Uh, no. Boy, 
I apologize. All that, all that makes sense to me. I mean, I understand. In fact, I heard a story, and I don't know if it's just hearsay, but you know, a temple worker or a temple president back in Russia or someplace decided to ask a group of people how many were up, how many tribes were represented, and all of them were. Yeah. And so I understand that. But we, we gathered with the, This is where they didn't go off planet. You know, yeah, what about eating last week with Joseph Smith? Maybe I can bring the references, but he said that they did go off planet. I describe your theory that they did. I think you're you're on the earth, but. This is very close. No, no, Joseph Smith never wrote that. There are people who ascribe that to Joseph Smith. There's a very big difference. No, no, the, the one I, the case I just, I just read this last week, but the case where they're talking about it, and Joseph walks them out, points it up, and said, there they are right up there. Oh, you're talking about, you're talking <coughs> the about the uh, Benjamin, yeah, no. Brown, no, no, Benjamin not, yeah, Brown account. Joseph Smith, I think, was just jesting with them. But this is, this idea subscribes very clearly. If you're going to give them this, then how about the, um, this is very similar to what Robert Smith teaches, that they were the nomad to, up in the Ukraine areas, and there were retarded people that will come forth. Up in the, well, the, the you know, they're, mountain people, they're, they're, very, they're, they're very small people. Every culture in the world is going to come forth with their records, because the Lord has spoken to everybody. He says, I teach them the same things. So does Enoch fall into this group too? I mean... No, no, Enoch was before the flood. That's another kind uh, yeah. So did this coming down, the theory, you know, the Mars when you said coming down, was that before the flood? That was before the flood. So is that possible? That's where they went? Enoch? Not, not likely. Just a it, it, the move, moving from one planet to the next, no matter what energy or, or uh, phenomena is involved, phen yeah, phenomenon is involved, uh, is problematic. Who's going to survive that sort of thing? Now you can say, well, the Lord can do anything he wants, but that's making a magician out of him. He does follow rules. Yeah, and and the Mormon says so. Yeah, and so this is, you know, um, I, I just, I don't subscribe to the idea. All of those teachings about the city of Enoch, the city of God, Zion, uh, all of the rest, is all imagery connected with these planets. And like I say, if you take the online classes, all the, all the information is there. There isn't time to communicate it all. That's there. in the class? Huh? That's in the class? This is in the class? All this. Oh. 16 hours of this stuff. Uh, I, I can class. show you in one hour Revelation. little bits and pieces, and then there's 11 hours on the book of Revelation. Who do you know that can go through the book of Revelation verse by verse and explain it sensibly? He's got pictures too. <laughs> yeah, I have cute little pictures too. So it's even good for the kids. <laughs> In fact, the children. Maybe just, not. just an off question. Oh, no. I mean, I read a lot of this stuff, but how far off on, on your interpretation? I know you guys aren't going to agree with me, but Robert Smith, how far off are you guys off on your interpretation of the Book of Revelation? Um, I mean, Robert Smith looks at the looks at the Book of Revelation pretty much like everybody else does. And they'll cite one verse here and one verse there, and they build a whole scenario based on that. The blood moons is a good example. You know, the idea is the moon yeah, shall the moon <laughs> shall turn to blood, right? And so they look at that and say, "Oh, well, the blood moon. The, the, the there's this tradition about the blood moons, and and uh, it coincides with the Jewish festivals. So that must be an indication of something." But the prophets, when they said they're talking about the moon to turning to blood, they're talking about something that happens in a planetary catastrophe. It has nothing to do with Jewish festivals. Well, and the, what the tradition or the, the thing that's going around now, how there's multiple blood moons. Where in the scriptures does it say there's multiple blood moons? In addition, the Jewish festivals have to do with other things of Christ's life. It's, it, it, here's, here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line, guys. Joseph Smith and, 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 and the Savior, okay? In the sacred grove, Joseph Smith, what church should I join? Jesus says, join none of them. Because why? Because they're an abomination to me. None of them teaches the truth, all right? Who came up with this blood moon stuff? These, these guys that the Savior was talking to Joseph Smith about. 
They were wrong in Joseph Smith's day. I don't think they've improved on that situation. If it comes from the evangelical crowd, it's wrong. Bang, it's wrong. Baptism is wrong. Organization is wrong. Priesthood authority is wrong. And their interpretation of prophecy is wrong. And yet Latter-day Saints in the, in the absence, in this vacuum that exists in LDS tradition regarding prophecy, we, we try to fill it with all of these nonsensical things. The year 2000, Dwayne Crowther, uh, Cleon Skousen, uh, even some great delight is Bruce R. McConkie. The year 2000 is going to be seminal. It came and went. Why? Because they were just regurgitating the evangelical interpretation of prophecy. Joseph Smith, on the other hand, gave us some very important keys. One thing that I... And we talk about this in the lessons. When you look at multiple parts of what's going to happen at the second coming, the only one that has the cause for all of them is this cosmology. Other places take a little bit and they just focus on that one little part and they, they sell lots of books on it. Where this, if you start learning the science behind this, and all the signs, this explains all of them, in my opinion. Well, and, and if, if, if somebody will look at it honestly, they will agree with you. Well, that, uh, seeing eye, that's been a symbol. I understand the symbols. You see them all over the place. You just find them putting uh, meaning behind them for me. Yeah. Uh, there, there are so many symbols like the all-seeing eye. Mm -hmm. that, that uh, in, in masonry, it, it appears inside the pyramid, at the, at the top of the pyramid, at the point. Apex, I think is the right word. Yes? I got a question. So, I, I haven't read Velikovsky's books yet, but so he never came up with the idea of the planets being in alignment? No, that's Dave Talbot. That was Talbot first. Oh, Joseph Smith, then Talbot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Here, here, here's how it works Velikovsky. Well, Joseph Smith didn't come with it first. He was just restoring. Velik Velikovsky introduced the idea of planetary. Well, that was my other question. I just remembered uh, catastrophe. We teach that there's going to be restoration of all things. Is this? Do you think this uh, symbol is going to restore itself in the sky in yeah. the last days? Yeah, that's the big, that's the big sign. Not of not in every particular, wow. but Joe. That's what Joseph Smith was talking about. Who you were talking about the Homer Brown account? Hmm. You know, he goes outside and he says. He says, look up here. He says, see that little twinkler up there? Now see the one, he says, well first he says, Brother Brown, point out the North Star to me. And then he says, right up the North Star. And he, he says, he says that's, the, that's the North Star right there. And Joseph says, how do you know that's the North Star? He says, well, you use the Big Dipper and you line up the two stars on the cusp of the Big Dipper. You line these two up and up here, it points to that little bright twinkler, that's the North Star. Joseph says, you got it right. That's right. Now come inside and let me read to you from Doctrine and Covenants. And he starts reading those passages about the ten tribes returning and, and, and a highway is cast up in the, in the north. And, yeah, that's what I pictured when you were talking about. And all of that stuff, and all that stuff. And then Joseph swerves off and starts talking about a, a planet. planet coming back and he talks about a planet and he says what will happen he said the oceans of the earth will retreat to the poles because of the proximity of this planet well that's correct that's what would happen and all the land would be joined in one land bridge with the oceans at the two poles because that's how it was in the in the days of the patriarch before the flood you see? And Joseph explains it to him. He says, you know, if you take a bucket of water and you swing it over your head with some vigor, the water stays in the bucket. He says, if you slow down, it sloshes out. Well, this planet, when it joins with the earth, will cause the earth to turn slower. And when the earth slows down, the waters in the ocean will slosh out just like in this bucket. So the planet you're talking about, uh, Joe's talking about, you don't think is Mars when it comes back? No. 
he, he said in another place, the last grand sign yeah. will be called a comet or a planet. He says it in many places. Joseph uses in, in his explanation of the facsimiles, he uses the word star and planet interchangeably. To us, they're different things. To the ancient, they were the same thing. A star was, the stars that were predominant in the heavens were those planets, Saturn, Venus, and Mars. But they won't be again. But they won't be again. It'll be what will happen is it'll, it'll look like a comet because it'll have a prodigious tail. But it will be a planet. Only a planet had, can, can hold enough charge to create the electromagnetic effects that the last days are all about. So you're saying Joseph Smith said that planet's going to touch down with Earth? Won't touch down. Won't connect to it, basically, is what you were saying. They, 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 they will be locked in an in a electromagnetic embrace, yes. And it'll create this arrangement. You'll see the planet, and you'll see the plasma column. Now, there are some, uh, a few, like I said earlier, who have looked at this and said, well, I believe it's literal. Mars and Venus and Saturn are going to return to their place. I, I have no idea. Uh, that, that amounts to individual interpretation. There's no distinct delineation in the scriptures or in Revelation that I can see. But it seems obvious to me that Joseph Smith understood this, especially when he drew this picture that I showed you earlier of the three planets in this polar alignment. Joseph was a catastrophist. We've been raised in a world that, that um, promotes uniformitarianism, gradualism, says none of this stuff can, this can't happen. Nobody talked to you in grade school about that, did they? Did they talk to you about it in high school? How about in college? Or maybe, maybe beyond, did they ever talk about this? No. I took some classes online that does. Oh, good. <laughs> speak to me, speak to me. Anyway, that's, that's what it's about. Joseph Smith did understand this stuff. And he, he taught the early saints this uh, again, this is stuff that I do treat in the classes. One of them, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, he says, in a sermon, Joseph Smith once told us the last days are going to be like when you ride on a steamboat on the Mississippi, and it's going along and it hits a snag and it stops all of a sudden, and, and people and dishes and tables go flying. He says, that's what it's going to be like when this planet joins with the earth in the last days. We're not taught this stuff. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be pretty. I, I'd love to live to see the millennium. I would dearly love to see it. But I'm not sure I want to go through what we would have to go through to get there. Go by a cave. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't relish the people who survive. I, I feel more like uh, I want, would be one of, one, one of those who was taken. Um, because it's not a measure of righteousness. And I know that flies in the face of everything you've ever been taught in the scriptures. But when you get to the point where you understand this, then you understand the psychology involved and why that language is used. And, and it's just to uh, mitigate the angst of the survivors, just like we do with post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes? Well, it you're right, it might fly in the face of scriptures, but I'm curious because, I mean, isn't that what Zion is supposed to be established for, is a safe haven for the tribulations that if you... And, and it only, that, that only happens afterwards. Yeah, Zion's after this stuff. The, 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 that's why it makes no sense to go to Jackson County today. No, right, absolutely. No, I, I agree with you. So you're saying Zion is after the second Yes, yes. yes. I don't know about that. All of the early say, yeah, but this, this, this I is. I could be wrong. I'm no, no, no. I'm, I'm just saying this is ref what you're saying is reflective of what's being taught today, um, not by the general authorities, but right. by 
everybody else in the church, us, okay? Well, I thought I was different and, than that. And well, well the, the point, I'm wrong. Maybe what, I'm no, what I'm, let me, let me get back to this. I, I don't want you to think I'm trying to no, no. point you out. The early saints that came out here, the pioneers that came out here and settled these valleys, knew this one thing, and you read it in journals all the time. The time will come when the saints are going to be called to go back to Jackson County to build Zion. And when they do, it will be worse than the, Egypt, or the Israelites leaving Egypt in the Exodus. Worse. That tells you the sequence of events, coincidentally. There's a great planetary catastrophe. The people in the mountains survive, which is one of the reasons I think Joseph Smith decided to relocate the saints to the Rocky Mountains because he knew the dangers of living in the Mississippi River Valley. It's going to be swept clean. And when I say swept clean, I mean everything in 50 feet of topsoil we'll is going to go. Will be a job. Well, yeah, that, that was one of the early phrases my <laughs> wife's quoting. Won't be as much as a yellow-tailed dog to greet the saints when they get... It will be a wasteland. No trees, no houses, no people, nothing. But the people in the Rocky Mountains will survive. But they'll have to go back. It'll be a new exodus. And getting from here to there is going to be a huge trial. And they will then build Zion. So that's how I come okay, up with that no, sequence. I agree with you on that. Yep. Here's a, a thought that I think goes along with this imagery. That there's a saying that the temple that's going to be in Zion is going to come from the heavens. Where's the original temple? It's that imagery. It was. It was so in the heaven. The pillar of fire by day, night. You know that will be. The, the prophets have often said that, that there will be no need for the sun in those days. The the heavens will, and the earth will be illuminated by the glory of God. Well, the, lang the term glory of God was the word that was used to describe the light that emanated from these planets in antiquity and the plasmas. The plasmas are the same thing as we see in these lights. These are plasmas. Their primary characteristic is light. This goes along with the temple. And when two planets get close enough together, there's an exchange of potential that creates a plasma, and the plasma is just like an arc light. It lights up the heavens. And, and the sun becomes irrelevant. Day and night, the earth is lit, yes. Well, just going back a bit, did you say that people in the Rocky Mountains would be safe? Safer. Oh, safer. 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 Okay. Yeah, there's still going to be earthquakes here, isn't there? There's going to be problems. Oh, there, yeah. Uh, the Wilford Woodruff vision. Uh, he sees it all clearly. He says, describes the destructions uh, world over. And then he sees Salt Lake and he says, he says there's a badge of mourning on every door, which means every family had lost someone. But he said there are no people in the streets. The windows were closed and shuttered. The doors were locked. Nobody was sashaying out into the street. And, and he, he didn't explain why or didn't wonder in print why, but the reason is quite clear. They will know how to deal with it because the prophet, just like Moses, is going to be telling them what to do. Because the Lord told them. Because the Lord told the prophet. It's pretty simple stuff, folks. I, I, I'll say this. People who think that the church is out of the way today and making mistakes and doing the wrong thing and not behaving and that they accuse the brethren of all kinds of strange stuff, they're wrong. The time will come when there will be a prophet who will understand these things and he'll step up and he'll come from the leadership of the church and he will straighten things out. He will tell us how to survive. Right now we're being tested to see if we'll listen to that stuff. It's, salvation has always been a strictly personal thing. If you depend on somebody else to lead you to salvation, you're bound to have a problem. You have to find out the answers for yourself. Yes? When are we going to do the video where the temple of God comes down out of the clouds and lands on the earth? As soon as you get it done, we'll do it. <laughs> as soon as you have time. <laughs> so, do, do we have just one more second of time? Well, sure, and I, I have a question too. Okay. We'll get some time. 
Well, all right, let me, let me say what I wanted to say and then we'll treat your question, okay? Here's the deal. And, and Stephen, who just asked the question, or was, was about to ask the question, deserves the credit for what I'm about to tell you. When, when, did they build, when did they build the conference center? It was during President Hinckley's tenure as president of the church, right? When I was on my mission. 1990 so, something? 99. 99, 99? yeah. 99, 2000. Um, if you look on Google Earth today. Or here, I'll give you a picture you put on the camera. Well, I don't know if the camera will be able to see it, but I can uh, try. It, it can. If you look on Google Earth, it shows a picture of Temple Square. You can see downtown Salt Lake City, and you can see the visitor center. Okay, you hold that up there. You can see <laughs> the visitor center. And on the roof, you can see this curious arrangement of steps, fountains, trees, whatever, architecture. So and it's very purposeful. It wasn't just happenstance. And lo and behold, what is it? What is it, Stephen? It's the heaven man. It's the son of man. It's the alpha of the omega. It's, it's it's alpha and omega. Big O. Even the trees that outline the triangle or the alpha, there's three of them. That is very there's three sections on each side. That's very purposeful. The whole thing is purposeful. They even have the cross in it. it when you look at the where they have the, the water, the they, they, water? They, they have the cross. Yeah, that's the cross. So that that, that, now, 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 let me be specific about this, people. It, this, 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 this symbol appears nowhere else in LDS tradition. Just a minute, guys. Just this appears nowhere else in LDS tradition. It doesn't appear on the Nauvoo Temple. It doesn't appear on the Salt Lake Temple. This symbol has only been in existence in, 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 in academic terms, so to speak, since about 1990. Well, I, I would argue a little different because I think it's the same symbol as Moroni. His feet are well, yeah, the but that doesn't look anything oh, like yeah, what's it, on the it, roof. It, it's, this is my point. It's, this is my point. S somewhere along the line, for those who think the church doesn't get revelation today, okay, somewhere along the line, somebody valued that symbol enough to put it on the roof of the conference center. And here's the kicker. It's not just oriented any old way. It's oriented which way? Uh, north. North, which is where what appeared in the past? This very image, this well, very image. And why put it on the roof? Why put it where nobody's going to see it? Well, somebody did, I did. <laughs> I didn't see that. And the only reason, the and the only reason he picked up on it is because he knew, of the classes. he knew this stuff. Yeah, because of the online classes. Yeah, the online classes. Otherwise, that image is irrelevant. It has no relevance to anything. It has the crest. Except it, it was very, crest. yeah, it does. Except it was very expensive to put it there. And, and the one thing that Anthony pointed out to me after, it, the crescent is almost at midnight. Yeah. Not the crescent, the crescent is The crescent is right here on this side of the orb. And when the, can you consider that it rotated in a counterclockwise position. And that the most sacred time of day is when the crescent was on the bottom. It was on the top at noon. It's approaching midnight. Which midnight is position. We're what what is the crescent actually? I don't understand what it's, it's, just it's the lighted. It's, it's the, the lighted pyramid. portion of oh, the. I know that's what it is. Oh, what is it? Where it came from? Yeah, it's the is, sun. Oh, it's the sun behind. The, him? the sun on the. The sun behind him. No, no the Saturn's the over here. The sun's over where, here. Where, where, where does the crescent on the moon come from? Well, yeah, when the Earth passes in front of it. No, it's there all the time. It's there all the time. It's there all the time. And the same thing was true of Saturn in the ancient sky. It was there all the time. But the crescent appeared to rotate because of Earth's rotation. It's Saturn the wasn't same spinning. Side of the, sun, the moon that's facing the sun. Anyway, that's 
take the classes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> look, look, my point is this. Anyone that thinks that the church is out of the way today is wrong. This symbol on the conference center is not accidental. It's very it's purposeful. It can't be. And, and only all the, all the portions of it, it was perfect. And only someone that understands the symbolism of antiquity could put it there, just like all the other symbols on the Salt Lake and the Nauvoo Temple. Every one of them in the lessons, I go through and I explain these things. It, these symbols are inside the conference center too. A big one is the water found inside the conference. Yeah, there are many analogs because this thing gave rise to all of the sacred symbolism of mankind. But this thing is so close. This thing is so obvious that it, it argues eloquently that there are informed people in the hierarchy of the church that understand this. That's the only way it could have appear and on that building. That's the only reason that the Deseret book is still carrying your books after all these years. <laughs> well, if that isn't the reason, it should be. <laughs> anyway, any time for more questions or are we about done? Um, I got kind of a simple question. Okay, that's right. You had a question. You have the, the cross there and then you have the crescent, wherever the crescent might have been, and the earth rotates. Would that crescent stay with the cross? Yeah. Or would it, or would they both slightly be on a different rotation than each other? No, they would all appear to rotate, rotate in tandem because it's the Earth's rotation that yeah, so they would is be the. Pro they the, over a greater period of time they might they might dissociate for one reason or another, but but uh, on a short term day to day basis, no, it's the Earth's rotation that created the changes. And when Mars descended, it it probably took it a, a good long time to do that. Um, but I can't emphasize how important it is that the, the idea of, of the condescension of God and then the ascension, that's what the temple ritual is, is an ascension ritual. You you're, are like the ancient prophets walking in their, their footsteps when they rehearsed the ascension of Mars. That's what Isaiah is talking about when he said, I was wounded in the house of my friends. It, it's an allusion to this planet as well as the story of Christ. And that's the double entendre of prophecy. That, that they do it all the time. Joseph Smith said that the stone cut out without hands that Daniel talks about and rolls forth, he says that's the gospel filling the earth. But it's also the story of Mars that is cut out of the heavens without hand and it rolls forth till it fills the whole earth. It's the same story. And, and, and the beauty of, the, of these, this imagery is it's adaptable to any age or period of of the earth. And Joseph Smith demonstrates amply how that's done. If we think that's if yeah, if we think that's the only explanation for it, then we don't understand prophetic symbolism. And, and this is the value of taking the online <laughs> lessons. <laughs> so here, here's I, I have a, a loose theory. Okay. Maybe you can solidify or tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> but um, Jacob's name changed by the Lord to is Ra El. Right. Um, and, you know, in, in the Egyptian tradition, in many traditions, the planets were gods. That's the right. The gods were planets. That's right. And uh, in, in my all, opinion, in, in is Ra El is referencing God planets, and there's three of them. And I see two male and one female. I think Israel is referencing the polar configuration. But that's my loose El theory. Is Saturn. El is God. Yeah, El is an ancient name for Saturn. Yeah. Ra, so six, six, six. Ra is yeah. an ancient name. It's, it, now understand, down through the history, the people confused their own pantheons, you know. The father became the son, the son became the father. Even in Mormonism, Christianity today, there's a big argument about, well, is Jesus the father, or are they one, or are they separate? We talk about this in the online classes. But this is the or origin of the name Israel, right there. Isis, is, is just a shorthand for Isis. This, this, this is Venus. 
this is Marv, and this is Saturn. Well, you solidified my theory. <laughs> so it's I'm very happy. brilliant that you got that on your own. And yeah. Well, and and that's, and what that do we thing. call ourselves? We call ourselves is brought hell. Ides. Yeah. And well, yeah, ides. But we're calling ourselves the planet. We are so Israel. We we're, we're using these ancient names, and we don't know it. Another thing I talk about in my Revelations classes, John repeatedly uses the word "Amen," but the word he's referencing is "Amun," which which was a variation of. Ra or Atu, or which were all referencing the planet L or Saturn. The Saturn used words, to be on Saturn. Words, Saturn what, what, he's, he's simply referencing another cosmological. We think he's saying amen to what he's saying, like we say amen at the end of a prayer. That is not what he's saying. He's naming God. I wasn't, I wasn't kidding. Was I kidding when I said I went, I can go through Revelation verse by verse? Do I do that? Almost. Oh. <laughs> Very right. close. All right, let me ask this Ryan. Did I go through it? <laughs> but all the imagery, <laughs> do. You, you go all over the, all the imagery and stuff. The, the stuff that trips everybody up, you go over. You got, you've got. I, I so, highly recommend the class. The point, thanks. The point is. With the, that I made in this lesson is that it's an evolving work and I by no means have all the answers but I have enough to make some definitive statements and and where this statement is in error in some cases I've corrected that and I've moved beyond it and that's what the classes are about and maybe before I die I'll find something else and I'll share it when I do but this documents my journey through all of this. Did you have a comment? No, I'm good. Okay. Yeah. I just want to say real quick, uh, my whole life I, I bought tons of books trying to figure out what Revelations meant, and, and I still have all those books, and none of them really quite made sense. There was a couple pretty good ones, but they were all from the Christian crowd. And uh, as soon as I read yours, Every single verse just was absolutely perfect, just like a puzzle piece. There was yeah. nothing left out, and I mean, it just had to be the way it was. This explains and, and, so much. And if it was, and if it was just the Book of Revelation, I could see people questioning whether it was right or not. But the fact that it answers the mythology and the tradition, sacred and or or not, of ancient cultures the world over, is pretty strong argument. The fact that it explains the imagery of all the prophets, not just the book of Revelation, is additionally strong argument. The fact that it illuminates your temple rituals and explains those puts a lock on it, folks. N none of those theories that Ryan's talking about in all of these books he's read have the ability to cross those lines, so to speak. It even crosses culture. That the reason that yeah. elephants are sacred in India, they saw it in the heavens. Yeah. It explains so many things. The, the same, the same, the same yes. image. And then the, the that showed was the, the trunk. Yeah. It showed the it, it, tusks of the of the bull, the head of the bull. This was the bull of heaven. Is also also this these are the tusks on the elephant. Depends on what culture you were living in when, or that was remembering these things and what icons they assigned to this. Uh, this is, I think this it somewhat is, has to do with this, what the it, animals this or is whatever even, they saw yeah. in the area. That this is even the there. horse with with bridles. Yeah, a lamb is another, uh, because because this was also the ram, the ram-headed god. Um, uh, his son would be the lamb. Talk about that a lot. So Christ didn't depict himself as the lamb of God just because he was meek. It's because it, it was a solid cosmological symbol that the people in his day could understand. Behold, the lamb of God. 
wait a minute, that my religion talked about the Lamb of God. It was the, it was the, in the heaven. This is the man. That's how conversion happens, folks. Well, Joseph Smith talked about that the Holy Ghost is pure intelligence. Yeah. And this is intelligence. Joseph said, a man can be saved no faster than he gains knowledge. And, and I know today in the church, the emphasis is all on the spiritual. I don't want to denigrate that. I don't want to detract from that. But I want to emphasize there is a temporal component. And the language that we use in the scriptures, the prophets used and that we use today, is all based in this symbolism. All of it, all of it, all of it, all of it. Any more questions? Silence. <laughs> Silence of the lambs. That's holding the earth, too. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's Hercules. Right. That's yeah. Hercules. Solomon holding the, the... Was that Hercules holding it? Not yeah. Solomon, uh, uh, Samson Atlas. holding the... Atlas or Hercules? Doesn't matter. These are his arms. This Venus was the head, and Mars with the plasma was the thing. So that what they saw, the way they illustrate this is like this. And this this is called, I call it, heaven man. Well, if you put the crescent on Venus, it's happy man. But anyways. This, yeah, well, <laughs> that, uh, I call this heaven man, but Christ said it the is... Son of man. The son of man. Isn't it peculiar that he would call him, instead of calling himself the son of God, that he would call himself the son of man? Why would he do that? I know. The son, the son of man, it's my position that the son of man is a reference to this image. He's calling himself the God of your forefathers, the one that they worshipped. I am he. That's what he said. I am Alpha and Omega. I am the Son of Man. I am the Messiah. Let me, let me read a quick verse for you. This, this is... Here's, here's I the... I am that I am. I am that I am. That's a tetragrammaton. That's the, another way. But, but there's this lovely, lovely verse in Moses, if I can beg your indulgence and I can find it quickly. I've got it marked somewhere. Just while you look at the program, I kind of said that uh, that was kind of Joseph's own infusion of everything he really put and it wasn't a direct translation. Yeah, I, that, is that what you're saying? That's what I think. Yeah. No, I mean, he could, the uh, program price is coming in a lot of ad lib right now because, I mean, basically no, Joseph took a lot of liberty with the program price, and that really it's not a direct translation at all. It's it's similar to the King Paul discourse where he just summarized everything and put it the way he yeah. knew it was. Look, they criticized Joseph Smith because he he wrote. Let, let me finish this, don't. Stephen. He, the the thing that happens with this is they criticized Joseph Smith for writing the Book of Mormon without having the plates in front of him. He was looking at a peep stone in a hat. How could he possibly write the Book of Mormon? Should have had the plates in front of him to do it. Okay, well, but, but then when we see the facsimile and it doesn't match the copy, they say, well, he just made that up. You know? But we run away. Yeah, I know that's a close. So okay. I need to have the room cleared. Are you close? Okay. I'll shut the door and do it. <laughs> yeah, but actually, the, uh, we have to stack the chairs here, and everything. Read that scripture. Let me, yeah. let, me, let me read this for you before we go, guys. You've got to hear this. Here's the, Lord, here's the Lord speaking through, Mo, speaking to Moses, this invention of Joseph Smith. The Lord said, Blessed is he through whose seed Messiah shall come. For he saith, I am Messiah the king of Zion, the rock of heaven, which is broad as eternity. But here's the clincher. Whoso cometh in at the gate and climbeth up by me shall never fall. There it is. It's the 
stairway See, to heaven. That scripture means more right now than it did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was that? What was that? Scripture? Gotcha. Look. Oh, that's Moses? Oh, Goes in Moses? Okay. Yeah, you'll find it. That's it. Stack the chairs. The lady said, Move. It's time to go. <laughs>